Yes. He's working on it now um, at the University of Barcelona. Um, he's assistant professor at the University of Basel in Switzerland, and he's editor of Heteropsia Iberica, or Heteropsia, yeah, Heteropsia Iberica, uh, published by Brill. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation. Could you speak to the microphone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for the for the invitation. Thank you very much for, for the incredible um, how helpful you are being and how nice during these days. Um, I'm going to I'm going to read uh, in English. I'm going to read the story and uh, uh, we can discuss after that. We are short. So we can discuss. Um, but this paper is based on a, on a question by Hero um, about the relation between Erasmus and and Luis de Granada. So I uh, two months ago, when Hiro Hirai invited me to give a talk on Erasmus and Fray Luis de Granada and the role in Japan's recent century, the assignment seemed beautiful, if not impossible, to check it. Speak louder. Uh, do you remember this way? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, my knowledge of Japanese history was and is very limited, and I neither speak nor read the language. Uh, nonetheless, Hiro's proposal uh, presented a very important opportunity to explore how Spain Project to Japan in the 16th century and how the Spanish imperial expansion dealt with diversity and identity. Uh, prior, to, prior to Marcel Batallon's masterpiece, Erasmus in Spain, the history of Catholicism in early modern Spain was considered to be a monolithic phenomenon and an ideological continuum. To be precise, another masterpiece, uh, Menendez Pelayo's History of the Spanish Heterodoxes, stressed uh, 60 years before that the role played in that history by the Spaniards defended, wrote, hid, and communicated their dissidents uh, was a real one. This monumental work uh, presented, amongst many other things, a religious history of the peninsula uh, that was vastly more complex uh, than the myopic, stereotyping, and patronizing approach to the country, its history, and its culture by the 19th century French. From there, one of Menendez Pelayo's argument was that even if we were entitled to consider the history of Spain as a triumph of history of Catholicism, it has been so over a wide number of names quieted down by its imperial marks. In this line of argumentation, Marcel Batallon accomplices another turn of the screw and gives an example with the, his Erasmus in Spain that even the inner history of the victor is far from simple. The relation between Erasmus and Fray Luis de Granada offers some insights into this problem. And both authors played a major role in the history of early modern Spanish culture. Both produced works which were widely used as tools for evangelization, and both were active during two, different, uh, two very different periods in the history of Catholicism that somehow complemented each other. These three aspects were indeed interdependent. So I hope to show you shortly, but I will address them only from the second one, that is, from how Erasmus and Fray Luis de Granada played a major role in the Spanish evangelical movement. As happened with the image of a Catholic Spain, evangelization was considered for a long time as an unyielding phenomenon, even if it was an important aspect to shed light on such a complex period of the Spanish golden age. Besides, from, from the French origins of modern Hispanism onwards, the idea of evangelization seem to be immediately bound to another common concept, intolerance. This assumption has been ubiquitous among uh, European, American, and less, frequent, and less frequently Spanish scholars. Without question, there were explanations. The history of the, Span or of the expansion of the crown of Castile is both imperial and doctrinal. Uh, formally, at least, from the uh, 1486, when Pope Innocent III conferred religious patronage uh, of the Kingdom of Granada to the Crown of Castile. It also required the partnership of the famous Spanish Inquisition as a continuous source of religious, doctrinal, and even social and political means of punishment and coercion. However, we need to remember that prior to the founding moment for the Spanish black legend, that is, the apology beyond the launch, the Inquisition was much louder by a great number of European intellectuals and institutions showing it the necessary mechanism to eradicate the shameful Jewish and Moorish rules from the Spanish soil and to avoid the wars of religion as they can be. 
During the 20th century, however, scholars approach to the problem shifted from this monolithic interpretation to a widely different approach that what we are referring to with the word evangelization. It could well be seen as the effort to convert those who have not had previous contact with Christianity, but in the concrete case of Spain, it is also the, it is also the enterprise of converting the Jewish communities and the Muslims who inhabited the territory to gain from the Muslims. Even if the distinction between them can still meet, the inquisitorial documents tell us quite a different story. There you have the reason why. Before focusing my attention on Japan, I will give you a brief summary of the state of affairs of the evangelical concept in the Castilian crown and its environment. I will talk firstly about the peninsula. Uh, as Dylan Niger has proven, the concept of blood can be analyzed uh, through a political lens. Although, although the invention of the purity of blood cannot be ascribed to the Spaniards, it certainly can be said that early modern Spaniards, in contrast with the rest of European nations around them, transformed the intricacies of the concept into a perverse art. To sum up, pure blood was that of the Cristianos viejos, or the old Christians, that is, those who could prove that they would have neither Jewish nor Moorish ancestry. The history of the conversos and the cohabitants of the three religions in medieval Spain has been written in very different manners, stressing or blurring its importance, mythifying or dismythifying it. For our purposes, it will suffice to mention that from the 15th to the end of the 16th centuries, these communities were forced to a mass conversions, and those who refused were expelled from the peace. The role of Erasmus and Erasmianism was fundamental in the new Christian communities. Erasmus' more popular works offered a reduction of Catholic religion to its basics and offered a practical guide for Christian women. The lingua, the paraclesis, and the incubidium were also translated and widely read. These texts were much indebted to the doctrine of the Devote Moderna, which intentionally encouraged a personal approach to the Christian religion and presented Catholicism critically as needed restoration. This explains, for instance, why the only known translation into Spanish of the Praise of Folly was discovered in uh, 2012 in the library of the Athel Synagogue uh, and was copied by and protected by the Jews in the 7th century Holy. I will provide just a brief example of the use of Erasmus for the indoctrination of the Praise Coast in Spanish movement uh, converted to Christianity. In Valencia, on the east coast of Spain, there was a vast community of them. When the emperor, Charles V, uh, visited the region in 1528, he found the situation of the Moriscos unacceptable and sent the Franciscan Bartolomé de los Angeles uh, the same year. His mission was to take care of their evangelization and to teach Arabic to a number of creatures. After visiting the area, Bartolomé was clear in his report. The Moriscos were keeping their old religion, and many priests were satisfied with the mere fact that they attend to the service. The young priest, Pedro Chinchon, a converser himself and one of the most prolific translators of Erasmus into Spanish, made the most of the visit of the emperor and the, of the general inquisitor, presenting them a book called the Anti Coran, Anti Corano, a compilation of 36 sermons intended to help preachers and missionaries to evangelize the Moriscos. In 1535, three years after the publication of the anti Quran, he published another book, The Christian Dialogues Against uh, the Muhammad Sect and the Pertinacy of the Jews. His approach here is not to provide uh, material to the preachers and the evangelizers, but rather to present a discussion between a Christian who is learning Arabic and his Muslim teacher. The Rasmian approach in this case is clear not only because of the substance, but also because of the perspective. As for the Americas, the Spanish viewed the natives as docile and less capable of intellectual development and physical effort than other races. Furthermore, they were seen as coming from a golden age before civilization and lacking in spiritual guidance. Given the massacres of the, by the conquerors, the intestine wars, the epidemics brought from Europe and the dismantlement of the Inca and the Aztec empires, it became easy for the new elite, the Spaniards and the rising Creoles, much later, they control over the territory. With the exception of the Mayans, the lack of a developed writing system, and the first attempt by the missionaries to create, to create an accurate representation of the languages required a succinct uh, message for the Besides the forceful and mass conversions, the task of the 
Franciscans and the Dominicans was to go first to stop the abuses against the Indians committed by the Spaniards, and second, to establish a system not only of formal conversion and practical submission, but rather to provide them with an adaptation, or rather simplification, of the Christian doctrine to its basis. The Spanish missionaries soon saw the possibility of superposing Christian theology to the native religion. I give just a quick example. In contrast to Japanese culture, Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas, uh, they all have the concept of a god creator of the universe, which quickly was converted by missionaries to the God of the Christians. The aim to preach a simplified version of Christianity was motivated by the risk of misunderstanding involved in the process and to avoid the rise of a hybrid and fanciful interpretation. This prevention was partly related to the common prejudice about the Indians and partly to concerns that the new world could become a hideout for heterodoxes and heretics identified by the Inquisition. The Spanish theologians soon composed a number of manuals or catechisms called doctrinas, which were a brief compendia of the Christian faith. The Franciscan Juan de Tomarraga, who was the first bishop of Mexico, of Mexico, played a fundamental role in the design of these texts. He composed and printed four in the uh, 1540s, taking much of Erasmus in Canadian and Paraclesis, obviously free from all the controversial matters and never acknowledging him as a source. And he also invested money to support the publication of the Doctrina for the Instruction of the Indians, written by the Dominican Pedro de Cordoba, who died in 1521 and revised by other members of the Council. As it is known, the practical interdiction of most of Erasmus' works in Spain from the 1530s to the 1550s will become formal in the publication of the first index of Valdez in 1559. However, missionaries consider that the Erasmus evangelical works should have the polemical ideas conveniently expurgated, offered a clear and accessible message easily adapted to the Indian community. In the case of Japan, to understand the mentality of the Europeans during the Renaissance, it can be of great interest read side by side the text by Christopher Columbus, Hernan Cortes, and Bartolomé de las Casas, a sailor, a warrior, and a priest, and compare them to the letters from Francis Xavier, the first evangelizer in Japan. From both readings, it can be easily seen that the Gutiérrez mental employed was diametrically opposed. If for the American native genesis, classical mythology, and medieval lore made a new reality accessible, in the case of Japan, there was the first contrast among two different civilizations, which can be measured by an equal scale. As Osami Takisawa uh, remarked in a recent paper, the Jesuits approached Japanese culture as a historical extension of the recent feudal past in the West, and how they quickly understood that the mission was condemned to fail if they did not first convert the aristocracy. This matter is of great interest, but outside the scope of this paper, I will dedicate the last three minutes to the chief role given by the Jesuits to Fray Luis de Granada in their evangelical program for Japan, and whether an opposition between the Dominicans and Erasmus lies behind the choice. Let me start by saying that from the point of intellectual history, the choice is far from being related to many of echoes and much more to a paradigm shift in Western history and with the warning of the Renaissance humanism. You can now refer to the timeline. You have, a, you have this timeline. Um, you can uh, refer to this timeline uh, provided at the beginning of this talk, where you will find that at least five works of Luis de Granada that were translated to Japanese and published by the Eastern Jesuit printing presses from 1591 to 1611. Uh, Uh, we have reasons to believe that there were more than these that, that have been lost. Uh, the hope of finding them cannot be discounted, as Professor uh, Jose Mioli, who is in the, in the audience, uh, showed us uh, not long ago with the first part of the introduction to the symbol of faith. Uh, it is not real, and 1611, which he recovered from the Halton Library at the forum. In order, uh, the order in the publication of the works, as you can see here, um, is, is probably, sorry, is of great importance. 
First, a summary of the lives of saints provides models for a virtuous Christian life. Second, the, the fifth part of the introduction of the symbol of faith, which is a compendium of the extant four parts of the book. Third, the book of for praying and meditation, which is halfway between a mystical treatise and an advanced catechism. Third, the guide for sinners, which is a treatise on salvation and the way to be spiritual, in other words, a manual of candor, uh, with a provocative universal promise of sanctity. And finally, the above mentioned first book uh, of the introduction to the symbol of faith, which is an exameral treatise on creation. In other words, real models of conduct for a virtuous life, the ethics of sanctity, the cardinal points of the orthodox doctrine, the introduction of the symbol of faith was translated to Latin as Catechismus in Symbolum Fei, which Luis de Granada stated as two, the creation of the world and the redemption of the souls, were central in, in this uh, of the point. A model of transcendence uh, through meditation, that is prayer and the Via Mystica, the universal promise of salvation, and the development of the idea of creation and nature from a Christian. As can be seen, this program is designed as an alternative to the religious reality of 16th century Japan from the perspective of the Counter Reformation. Luis de Granada, who saw, who saw uh, two of his treatises, The Book for Praying and The Guide for Sinners, banned by the Inquisition until 1584, permitted in his work the Philosophia Christi, much in the book to Erasmus, as it was a central importance to an ephemeral approach to Christianity, which can be seen as an extension of Erasmus' products. Examina with St. Ambrose and St. Basil. Even in the politics of evangelization of what was supposed to be the bastion of Catholicism, the approach to different cultures and religions required a slight modification and employed ideas condemned by the Inquisition in order to achieve peace. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you, Jose.
Thank you very much for your very uh, uh, interesting presentation. And uh, I'm very much uh, eager to know uh, about uh, how ex how much the uh, Erasmus work is uh, are available to the district education. Because I found uh, one very uh, interesting passage mm -hmm. uh, within the uh, Matteo Ricci's yeah. uh, versions of catechism. Yeah. And I, I found that the, uh, some uh, very uh, uh, impressive scene of the shipwreck. Uh, now, flag uh, is that is taken, I, I think, taken from the Erasmus' uh, colloquia. Yeah. And is it possible for yeah. them to uh, cite uh, explicitly or latently? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in, the, in the case of, of the districts, they, they know that they knew quite well uh, what happened. I mean, uh, they were able to read them. Um, we have proofs uh, in a number of Jesuits and in a number of authors, in, um, even in the Spanish 17th century, that were, uh, that were able to read the Adagia, but not in the version of the not central version of Paul Manucci, but in the version of Erasmus. Uh, in the case of America, it was forbidden to, to get uh, into, the, into America with uh, the works of Erasmus. Uh, you were only uh, were allowed to to use uh, his decopia or this or his manual for writing letters, but uh, they find a way to um, to have all these ideas of Erasmus, uh, the, mostly the, the this idea of, of uh, the links between um, theology, Christian theology, and humanism that was fundamental for, for the Jesuits as a part of the doctrinary program. So uh, and the Counter Reformation wasn't helping that much. In that way, so Erasmus was still uh, being uh, of real use. Um, the problem we have with uh, with that situation is that it's very difficult to find. Sometimes we can see we have the, we can have the feeling that we are reading something by Erasmus when it's something uh, that has nothing to do with Erasmus. Uh, it can have to do with uh, evangelization as a as a wider problem, or it has to do with a very uh, uh, idea of uh, the I mean, this, uh, this simple idea of the naked approach to Christ and that's got that kind of, of, uh, of situation. But uh, Erasmus was, uh, he has a very, a, very, a very big problem with the decision. But anyway, he was read by, for example, uh, for the use uh, conversos in Amsterdam, he was widely read. As a manual of conduct, even in the 19th century, they have this of Erasmus uh, of the Colloquia. Because it found that, you know, very funny how he presented all the domestic affairs and, and that kind of situation. So, I mean, as a literary author, he was read anyway. Uh, the problem is that you have to hide that. Uh, but in the case of the colloquia as well, you have two different models of uh, related to dialogue and, and, and catechism. You have the old model of the Erato process, where you have this, uh, this idea of the question and answer to a master and a student. And you have the Erasmus point of view. That is, for example, Fernando Pérez de Chinchón used that. I mean, a uh, uh, discussion between two different characters that you know have confronted ideas, and you have funny situations from there. So that's a model that is going to, to, to be going on, even if Erasmus is expanded. But, but I think that, that is very interesting. That in uh, Manuel Rich's work, yeah. that part of the uh, speech was yeah. sp spoken by the Chinese high. Uh, officials. Yeah. So it's very funny. Uh -huh. I think. So, but anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much for your information. Uh -huh. Another question. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. My name is Lucy from Keio University. Um, this paper says that the book of prayer and meditation yeah. was published in 1599, but I think it's not before. Is that a mistake? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it can happen. Uh, Maybe 
I check this. Um, I check this article in bibliography, and I think that that the date is. Uh, it could be wrong because you know it's this. Uh, Two volumes on private de Granada. Mm -hmm. is the, this, uh, this article about the fabricated the, the editions of private Granada in Japan. So I think the date is that it could be wrong because it's a 1989 article. Mm -hmm. It's the only, I mean, the only Spanish uh, uh, second uh, reference that I can find. And uh, he said uh, this book is not to be found yet. Yeah. But uh, the recent study. Yeah. Written by uh, one graduate student yeah. at Kyoto University it says that a, a manuscript oh, yeah. of this book was found yeah. or proved to be the translation mm -hmm. of this book. Yeah. And it was found uh, in Osaka, yeah. the village of Osaka, mm -hmm. in the beginning of the 20th century, yeah. uh, and copied by a hidden Christians. Yeah. And uh, the content is exactly the same as in this book. So, yeah. this is the information. No, no, no. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is something that I want to to, to, to I want to make a difference between the, the manuscript translation, uh, the manuscript transmission, and the printed transmission. Uh, this is only printed material. Because I think that in the printed material, at least you have the idea that even if it, uh, you, know, you have a lot of circulation of manuscripts, this were the idea of the, of the Jesuits. The, what they want to take from, I mean, the real evidence we have of what they want to make it, uh, you know, just to uh, circulate in, in Japan. That's why I only chose the, the, the printed edition of the manuscripts. But of course, you know much more than I about the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Japan. Just, uh, I think that the comparison between the book and Uh, he had that in mind. 
of a uh, uh, universal criteria. So I think that, that, mm -hmm. that were the main reasons. Even even in Spain, among Jesuit, his text was popular. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, according to you, what is the reason uh, Jesuit did not produce their own oh. text like that, but just adopted this? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that they didn't produce a text like that. The, probably, uh, the, the thing is that Luis de Granada is very, um, when you have something that's good and it's very clear, why well, uh -huh. even to, you know, just to remake it? Um, uh -huh. Luis de Granada was addressing problems in, uh, and of course, you know, it's simple, it is very simple. For example, if you think about uh, a Jesuit thinker, a Spanish Jesuit thinker from the 17th century, Batasar Gratian, Batasar Gratian had a lot of problems with Inquisition. Okay. He's not a at all. But you know, if you have uh, probably the Jesuits thought, okay, we have something that works. Mm -hmm. uh, the Inquisition has read it, you know, like 20 times, so it's perfect. <laughs> so we, don't, we won't have any problems. Yeah, but because I could, in my understanding, mm -hmm. Jesuit prefers produce their own text to, you know, to vindicate the, their supremacy of their 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 method. Oh, yeah. Producing text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, have to, you have to make a difference between between the, the, the radio studio I and mean, you have to make a difference between Jesuits as a, as a order, you know, just free of the of the links between orders, and uh, and the intellectual production of Jesuits, and uh, the use of this kind of text. Okay. You, you have to, in a way, you can see this. Uh, we don't have to see this like a, a difference between orders, but you know, as a, a when you are teaching, this is a good manual. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, for your students, they are going to understand, it's very clear, it's very extensive, it addresses all the problems you will have, so you don't need to do something different. Of course, if, uh, from Francisco Javier and uh, onwards, uh, what you will have for, in the approach, for example, to, to, to Japan, you have a, a real insistence in, in rhetoric and, and you know, in, in the, the idea of convincing instead of evangelizing, it's a very different approach. For, and different to the approach of America, where you don't want to find it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Please thank Jorge for his lovely.